So it's the most asked question from the back of the car when you're traveling anywhere during a holiday season, and as it turns out, it's one of the most asked questions in the journey of our faith. Are we there yet? We think there's a lot of insight into the Christmas story to help us process information like this. And so we are looking at the story of the shepherds today. And in Luke, the second chapter, it says, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they were told. This morning, I'd like to talk about five steps that the shepherds took in their journey and how important it is for us to understand that in our own. And it starts with this, I don't care. How many have ever said that? You know, sometimes it's on a little thing, where would you like to eat? I don't care. But it can mean a lot more than that sometimes. Uh, no one actually aspired to be a shepherd. You didn't go to school to be a shepherd. It was the job opportunity for those who had no discernible skills and no opportunity. It was the original shift work. And so people would not desire to be a shepherd. In fact, if you were the least ranking member in the household, the, the littlest brother, uh, the most insignificant, least talented one, that would wind up being your job. And the shepherds in the Christmas story, I don't know if you noticed it, but when I read it, they weren't just working in the fields, they were living in the fields. How would you like to be living out in the fields, keeping watch at night? Why do they have to keep watch? Well, because there are predators that will come and try to kill the sheep. And uh, that means the work can potentially be dangerous. It is also uncomfortable. There are no comfortable places out in the fields. It's unappreciated and it's undesirable. And when you have a job that is all of those things, it does something to your head. There's just a way you start thinking and processing life. You, you do what you have to do, but you don't do one thing more. Just the bare minimum is enough. And you certainly don't get your hopes up because good things happen for other people, not for me. I'm stuck in this dead-end job. You have so little that you're afraid of losing what you have, so you can be very risk-averse and protective over what little you own. And shepherds never get invited to anything. Nobody wants them to show up at the party. If they ever did, the looks on everyone else's faces would remind them that they actually were not welcome there. And here's the thing. When you get judged by others enough, you become judgmental. You can't help it. It's what happens. You start thinking things about those other people. Just because they have more means they are less. And so the cycle of judgment just begins to flow. And so the, the way you protect and defend your heart from future hurt and the way you protect what little dignity you have is you just develop the mantra that says, I don't care. Something's happening, I don't care. I don't benefit from that anyway. Someone else is going to get the credit for it. Someone else is going to get the benefit of it. I don't care. Something exciting is happening. 
I don't care. If I show up, they'll all act weird with me anyway. I don't care. And people often start with, I don't care. But something happened, and that moved them to the next step. The next step is, I am scared. I am scared. An angel appeared. Now, they're out in the country at night in the fields. There's no real artificial light, some stars and maybe some moonlight. But in that environment, if someone that you didn't see coming all of a sudden shows up next to you, how many of that would startle you? It startles you in broad daylight. It's just someone that's, it happens around here in the church every once in a while. We'll be going around and someone will show up in a place we didn't expect them to be. And people act very startled about that. But I want you to see something. The, the angel shows up and the glory of the Lord shone around them. It's like lightning, except it doesn't just flash and disappear. The whole hillside is glowing with this brilliant radiant light. And, and they're startled. But there's a lot more going on than that. Terrified is a word that's stronger than just startled. There are other kinds of fears that they are dealing with in their lives. They're being told some incredible news. A savior has been born. He is the promised Messiah. The baby can be found by you in an animal shelter. He'll be wrapped in cloths. He's lying in a feeding trough. Once again, if nothing good has ever happened to you, you don't believe it ever will. You could say, well, didn't a shepherd named David once become a king? Do you know how unlikely that was to ever happen? And the fact that it happened once would most certainly mean it could never happen again. And so these guys don't have any hope, anything good, is going to happen. And as a process, they lose their sense of adventure. They lose their curiosity. They don't want to take another hit in life. How many can you take before there's nothing left of you? This is what happens in people's worlds. This is what happens in our lives when we go through long seasons that are difficult, which leads us to the third step, was will I dare? Will I dare? As it turns out, there's not that many adventurous people in the world. Right? For example, let's say right after the service today, I was going to invite anyone who wanted to to go over to the airport with me. There are, there's, there's someone who's going to take us up in a plane, and we are going to parachute out of the plane in the freezing cold. How many are up for that? There's always just a few. I never get, no, I've never been in a service where the whole church goes, yes, I'm in. It's not how it works. We don't want to go up. We don't want to jump out. We don't want to be cold. We don't want to be any of those things. We don't want any sense of adventure. Now, uh, when my wife and I got married, we had a, a, a little bit more sense of adventure until we had children. And then you lose a lot of sense of adventure. We had a friend who was a pilot, and he flew into Jamestown, where we were living at the time, and he wanted to take us up in the plane for a ride. And we said, oh, that would be great. And then my wife said, if the plane crashes and both of us die, our children will be parentless. And so... I went up first, and then I came back down, and then she went up, and she came back down, and so we, we figured at least one parent was enough to keep the boat afloat, you know? <laughs> the sense of adventure, it diminishes over time, it diminishes with age, it diminishes with responsibility. And we can get to a place in our life where we don't dare anything anymore, ever. We lose it. We don't dare to apply to a school because if we're not accepted, it'll feel like rejection. We don't dare to apply for a job or put in our resume because we don't know if we can actually do the work and that will feel like failure. We don't dare to ask a person out on a date because what if they say no? Every single one of these feared responses aren't just saying no. We hear them as defining us. It becomes our identity. We actually, we start a self-talk. I'm just, a, and then we fill in the blank based on all the things that have disappointed us in our life. Now, some people argue all they want in life is a full belly and a comfortable chair and a warm bed, and I will tell you that is not true. That is not all they want in life. That's what they are settling for in life. That's what they're settling for 
and life because they are afraid. Will they dare? Leads us to the next step. Seek and stare. The shepherds make an astonishing decision, and it's after the angel leaves. It's not like the angel's even there intimidating them a little bit. You're going to go, right? No, the angels have gone back to heaven. The lights have all died down. It's just the shepherds, and they decided to go and see this thing. They're going to check it out for themselves. They are more concerned. This is fascinating. And by the way, the most important understanding in your spiritual journey, this is the most important concept, they are more concerned about missing out than being disappointed. They're willing to check something out, even if it means they're disappointed because they don't want to miss out on something that God might be doing. It's the most important step. So they hurry, and they found Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus, and it was just as it was described by the angels. And what's fascinating is these guys, in a dead-end job, so low on the rung of the ladder of life that they haven't even got to the first rung. They're still on the ground, and, and they had been included in the invitation to what God was doing in the world. But when they get there, what does it look like? Well, they tell us. There's a man and a woman and a baby, and the baby is wrapped in strips of cloth and laying in a feeding trough. I know we've all seen pictures of this, and we've seen renditions on television and in the movies, and what I will tell you is there was no special lighting effects. There weren't little halos around the baby Jesus or Mary or Joseph. There, there wasn't any, any angelic choir standing in the background singing a quiet lullaby. None of those things existed. None of it. You know, you've heard the Christmas carol, radiant beams from thy holy face. It's in a song, but it's not in the Bible. It's not what was happening. There were no beans. There was nothing. It was dark, and it was smelly. But this is the most astonishing thing. There was something about it that was special. This is the thing we forget in our lives. We keep looking for the spectacular, and the supernatural doesn't always explode in light or with loud noises. There was something about that man and that woman and that baby in that situation that was beautiful. There was something holy about it. There was something sacred about it, and it was undeniable. Once they saw it, they knew it was true. This is exactly what the angels promised us we would find. So even though there's none of those things going on, they can tell us something special. So let me ask you, would you rather stay there and see the special thing, or would you rather go back to the fields where your address is? Because if you go back to the fields, you've got rocks for pillows. You're watching sheep who are prone to wander. You're facing off wolves. And in that part of the world, you can even run across a lion or a bear. Who needs it? Who wants it? And yet they go back. Because you can't stand and stare forever. It's not how the world works. It's not how God works. How can you return to a dead-end job like that? It offers no meaning. And here's what I want you to hear. Meaning doesn't come from your job. Meaning is what you bring to your job. This is the problem. We keep looking for the job that's going to give us meaning in life. And so we get hired by a company or we get placed in a position and we get all excited. Finally, we're going to have this. And ask anybody on the first day of work. They think their job is wonderful. Ask them one year later. It's a stupid company being run by a bunch of idiots. It's just, what happened? Did people really get dumb over that 365 days? No. What happened was, is they were looking to that opportunity to provide meaning to their life. When you expect a job to give you meaning, you will always be disappointed because we do not discover meaning from the paycheck that we make or the work that we do. We discover meaning from a connection with our creator and a discovery of his purpose for our lives. And when you have meaning, it's amazing. You can go anywhere and do anything and it doesn't diminish you one tiny bit. Now, you don't have to stay at your dead-end job for the rest of your life. This is not a message about you should be happy with what you've got and stay there. I'm just telling you that it will not be a promotion or a different place 
or a greater paycheck that will provide meaning in your life. Meaning is found when you meet your creator. Now, this is interesting because for most of human history and, and, and a lot of people in the world today, the assumption is if my life is going to get better, what we need is a good king to be in total control and make everything right in the world, and then there will be meaning in the world and my life will matter. And so people have been waiting for that king all, all throughout human history. Jesus does the most astonishing thing. He shatters this myth that this, this capacity to experience meaning and a transformed life is not a byproduct of a political system. We don't need permission from a political leader. We don't need legislation in order for our hearts to be transformed. It's available to anyone, one-on-one, -on -one, when you meet the one. That's what scripture teaches us. So we're still waiting for the right person to be in the right position of power so that everything will be right. It's not how it works. You meet Jesus one at a time. It's not going to be a political leader or a king or some great person of power or popularity that changes our lives or our world. It's going to be when we, like the shepherds, come in contact with Jesus. It's his purpose for our life that changes everything. Jesus, when you discover Jesus is real, you discover your life has meaning. It takes us to the last step. Go and share. Go and share. Now, here's what I want you to know. People say things all the time they don't mean. You're going to, just a few days. You're going to try on a sweater that somebody bought for you. <laughs> and they're going to ask you how you like it. And you're going to say, oh, it's such a nice sweater. You don't mean it. You're never going to wear it again. You're going to throw it out. You're going to re-gift it to somebody else who will also say something they don't mean. I mean, it's just what we do. Aunt whatever her name is, who does her traditional whatever it does she does for the, the family dinner, and, and nobody ever likes it. Nobody's ever liked it. But we don't, want to, we don't want to disappoint Aunt whatever her name is. And so there it is on the table, and we all have to put some on our plate. And she's, she stares at us while we eat it. And how is it? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I don't know how you do it every year. It's amazing. Just don't know, don't know. I went to a friend's house one time, great family, great woman. She made, she was a good cook, but she, I don't know, I do not know what she did to the salad dressing. But when I took a bite of it, involuntarily, both the corners of my mouth dropped to the bottom of my chin. I couldn't help it. It was so bitter. And I just went, oh. And she said, don't you like it? And I said, oh. <laughs> It's good. <laughs> and she said, would you like more? I said, no, no, no. Too much of a good thing is not good. You know? <laughs> we do not say what we mean lots of times. But I will tell you something that is consistently, remarkably, and terrifyingly true. We always act with what we believe. What we believe is not what we say. What we actually believe is what we do. And this is challenging for us because there are things that we think that are different than the way we act and we wonder why there's this difference. It's because there's a deeper belief system inside of us. And this has to be brought to the Christ. It has to be addressed. So these shepherds who had been the offscouring of society, the lowest rung on the ladder, the, the people who are always left out, they're the ones who actually go and start sharing with other people. They start telling the story of what God has done. What happened? They were willing to risk a conversation. They, they were willing to talk about something other than the last confrontation they had with a bear or the stupid sheep that wandered off again. It's amazing what we fill our lives with. They talk about what they heard and what they saw. And the number one reason we do not talk about what we hear and what we see is because we're so concerned about what other people think of us. They'll think we're naive. They'll think we're simple-minded. They'll think that we, we don't think because we believe something they don't believe. But the shepherds 
They just went and shared. And it didn't matter whether someone believed them or not. All that mattered was that they shared what they had seen. And here's something I want you to know about sharing faith. Sharing faith is not the same thing as telling other people what they should or shouldn't do. You're giving them your rules for life is not sharing your faith. Sharing your faith is being able to say, this is what I have heard, this is what I have seen, this is the difference it made to me. That's sharing your faith. So those shepherds were in the fields around Bethlehem. And yet, in some ways, I think they actually took a further journey than everyone else in the Christmas story, even further than the wise men who came from afar. Because they had to journey past their doubts and their fears. They had to journey to a place to find courage. They had to take a journey past their own self-image and others' prejudices. They had to take a journey past people thinking they were gullible or naive. They had to take a journey past their willingness to be disappointed. And they wind up glorifying God. They go back to the fields. Same job, different God. Same sheep, different perspective. Now, God is not going to surround you with visible angels and flashing lights. But he will pour his grace into you so that you become the light that shines in a very dark world. Maybe you can move from I don't care to now I'm scared to I will dare to I will seek and stare and finally I will go and I will share because it's all true. God sent his son into our world to rescue us from a lesser life and a certain death. He insists everyone is invited, the wise and the wealthy, right along with the poor and the uneducated. No one, no one is left out of the invitation of grace. There is still good news for all the people. The light still shines in the darkness. It really is just as we have been told. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, it's, it's possible that the demands of this year have been more than you've been able to bear. The disappointments have been too great for you. And, and if you dare to do this, if you think about what that's doing to your willingness to risk, to dare, to try, you can become paralyzed, stuck, forever in dark fields with no sense of meaning. And what little you have, you're afraid to lose. But there's this incredible journey. And the journey is not to some palace. It's not to some mystical land. It's to a place where a man and a woman and a child were there, the most common of all occasions, and yet something spiritual, something significant, something holy was occurring right there. You are in a room today full of men and women and children, and we're ordinary in every capacity, but maybe, just maybe, right now, God is doing something grand and glorious in your heart and life, and you don't want to miss it. So, Father, Help us cast off the burdens of disappointment and the fears of rejection and the definitions of failure that we have assigned to ourselves. 